very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that uh, I'm standing between you and your lunch. <laughs> and uh, I would like to thank Dr. Koziol for inviting me to speak. And I don't know why I'm the last one. Probably uh, I'm part of the lunch. Um, well, my background is in finance. I have nothing to do with graphene. I know very little about graphene. Uh, I've been doing a lot of work for the last 25 years in investments. And I've been doing a lot of work investing in technology. And I've been doing that for the last 25 years. And I did pretty decent amount of investments, probably more than $200 million in various types of technology investments. And uh, the question is, why didn't I come to Cranfield on my G5, Gulfstream 5? I still do come on the standard UK tube. And the answer to that is because I'm doing technology investments. And that's what it is. Because technology investments is full of risk. And actually, the, the, when we talk about risk in terms of technology investments, one of those that's the hardest. Because let's say you do on what are the investments like bonds, stocks, whatever. There's an easier frame to evaluate the risk. But in technology, especially something new, something innovative, it's the hardest. And the worst part that I see, or I've seen, been seeing for the last many years, that as technology develops, the investment banking and the banking community are the least developed of all. They never change. In fact, as many other technologies develop, they didn't. And that's what one of the problems that I found. And in fact, today, there's so many <coughs> discussions or questions about bankers, and, and probably they are the, the dinosaur part of the whole uh, development of innovation. <coughs> Because bankers are the least to innovate. And I come from investment banking, and I can testify to that. Because I've been meeting all of them so many times and so many places and so many different occasions everywhere. So uh, there is a new technology that somehow that been called somewhat disruptive, and that is called blockchain. I don't know whether it's that disruptive as graphene or whether it's something that is just another fad. And for sure that most people know Bitcoin more than blockchain. That's one of the examples. And as Dr. Adam was talking about digital economy and so on, and I guess maybe this new innovation can be one of the disruption or creative destruction, if you may, that may come. But whether that will be true, that will happen, I don't know. And that cannot be measured against the price of Bitcoin. Please don't do that. <laughs> yeah? Because so volatile. Okay. So let's talk first about something that is the problem that I've been facing all along when it comes to technology investments, the conundrum, as I call it. And it's described down there, too much or too little information, yield the same result. No investments. You have been giving all sorts of information about your technology. You try to convince people, you give them everything that you want them to know. Well, nothing coming. Or you give too little, they say, you're not telling us everything then nothing's coming too. What's the problem? Something is not, going, something is, something is not right there. Yeah? And this is something that is uh, in game theory in economics. We call it basically the Nash no trade equilibrium. <coughs> equilibrium. What happened there is basically that no trade will happen, no exchanges will happen because there's a lot of discrepancy on both sides. And, and what's been called, for example, in the case of the, in, of the technology in, or innovators, we call it market for lemons. We don't know whether you're true, you're another lemon. Or just like the used car salesmen are doing about selling used cars. And that's being, uh, of course, highlighted by Josh Eklov, one of the economists. And on the other side, yeah, the other side, the users of fun is basically, they're looking for what we call market signaling problem. That is, how, how do I identify the signals? What was the right signal that I can pick from here or from there to say that this is a true winner? Everybody is shouting, like in this room, those who are in the graphene will say that I'm a winner, for sure. Nobody will say that I'm a loser. That's fair, right? So, how do I pick, for example, I'm an investor in this room and you are all innovators in graphene. How do I pick among all of you to say that you are the winner? It's very hard. And in fact, only time will tell. And that's the truth. So, how do we go about in all doing these things? And so, what I was thinking, and I, was, I want to share you just an idea. I'm not trying to sell anything here. I'm, 
I'm not uh, even trying to put any funds to invest in any project. But I just want to share an idea, and I think uh, it's a worthwhile idea for us to think about. Now, first of all, blockchain is not about Bitcoin, to be sure. It's about the technology of distributed database and ledgers. And uh, what I like about this technology is about the private public signature mechanisms, or basically what it means is basically uh, you can make a set of information to be public and another corresponding set to be private, and you can have a control over it, and yet you make it to be on the public domain. Yeah? And in the case of IPR, we can thought of an idea that you know, we can make those ideas to be announced publicly. For example, Graphene can make tattoo. Yeah? That's a simple idea. And yet, the relevant information which is needed to be protected are kept hidden. Yeah? And that's basically one of the ways to give something that make, make some sense to people, that graphene can make tattoo, and yet, how to make graphene to be implanted on those things must be hidden, otherwise it becomes a public knowledge and everybody can copy. Yeah? So, but the problem is, with such announcement is that it has low credibility. Nobody will just simply believe you unless they start to print on their hand and think that it works, then they will believe it. But more importantly for anyone is basically if there's a printing being done and $100 is going to be paid, right? And then what we say is we believe exactly what we say. And that's the that's a issue that how to, how to solve this thing. And, and, and this basically goes, goes back into what I call it information sufficiency. Yeah? Uh, because in economics, what, and, and as, as a, let's say, an investment analyst, or I want to do an investment, then what, I do, what, do, what do I analyze? I analyze basically the risk. And, and really what I analyze at the end of the day, the risk of the financial cash flow, what's coming through, right? I'm pro I probably will have less interest about what this graphene will do in all sorts of things that Dr. Kozio will try to describe to me. But I may be interested in how this one can make money. And that's what basically, as an investor, I'm interested in. And if that part, that specific part, that links whatever little piece of information that link to the money part, and I can verify that to a degree, then I have, I have more comfort on doing such investments. Yeah? So that's what we're trying to explain here in terms of blockchain technology. Yeah? And let's say that anyway, any IPR or any intellectual property is a piece of data. It's an information. Yeah? Whether it's bits and bytes or whatever. Whether you call it patterns, even patterns you can put them all on data. It's an image or whatever form. It's data. This day's digital economy, it is data. Yeah? So, a subset of the data can be disclosed, and another subset can be kept hidden, because you don't want to reveal all your data publicly. And let's assume that for the public data, you want to make it available, really, really to put it on public domain, just like a patent is a public domain. Yeah? And even most patent holders will say that, I will not write everything to my patent. I've seen many, many people who have developed patents. None of them admit to me that we have, they, have put, they, have put, they have written everything on their patents. In fact, many of them try to hide something in part of their patents. Yeah? So, the issue is, you put it on public address or public domain, that means people can see certain parts of your data, of your information, and this can be done on a blockchain database system. Okay, how to do that? I guess it's not the place to talk in detail about it, yeah? but that's possible. And this public address should have sufficient information for people to make decisions or to, to, to analyze whatever that people want to analyze. And in particular, in particular, the most important thing is to analyze the financial risks related to that information. And the most important thing in any patents is about economics, appropriation, rights. What money can I make out of it? That's the bottom line, as simple as that. And how much money I can make out of it. Yeah. And also, what kind of situation that I will face in getting that kind of returns on my investments. Now, these claims, of course, can be published and specified. That's no problem. Yeah. And, and many examples of to, to do that, actually. But uh, I guess the time uh, to explain in detail, it, it will take more time because uh, for each part, what's important is what Dr. Adams talked about, business model. Yeah? It's about having the business model being designed very carefully and and being put in such a way that you can really target it and, and identify the subject in much more precision. Yeah? And um, 
And what's most important about the blockchain is about what I call it, the, the immutability of the data, the transparency of the data, and later on, the auditability of the data which is available on the blockchain itself. And this is one of the things that, for me in finance, I love this. And in fact, not only that it's auditable, it's real time, anytime, by anyone, anywhere. Yeah? If you think about what I said just now. Because let's say you want to invest in a company, I will have to wait for a year before I can get the annual reports of the company. And I still have to decipher the whole accounting, and if I'm not an accountant, then I have a lot of works to decipher so much notes and footnotes, and these days all the accounting reports come with more notes than even the body by itself. Yeah? So, if you can have all these things to be transparent through a public database system that are transparent enough and can be audited and is immutable, that means cannot be changed, well, we might, we might not have Enron and we might not have Arthur Anderson anymore, isn't it? Yeah? So, these are examples of what can be done using blockchain. Now, more importantly is that if, if I made a claim as an inventor, if I made that, that claim and I'm, I'm, I'm going to be wrong on my claim, then I should be punished. Yeah? And this is basically one of the classical agency issues. Yeah? So if I can be punished as well through the system, then it's even better. Yeah? So how, how this can be done then? Yeah? So there's many processes and I would like to just make a simple remarks here. Because really, when you think about the blockchain itself as a data, it yeah, can be stored and can be executed. And whatever the economics rights, whatever the economic benefits as well, is going to be on the same platform. Now, let's think about payment versus delivery problems that we face all the time. Yeah? Payment is another platform, delivery is always another platform. <coughs> Even in the financial markets, the same thing. Yeah? Except you change money by money. So now, what if, if this payment versus delivery is on the same platform? That means whatever money you're going to get and whatever you're going to deliver is on the same platform. Well, that's one of the possibilities of the blockchain. Now, um, well, yeah, I'm just repeating all these things, but what is summarized here basically is all being said in blockchain computing systems called smart contracts. What is smart contracts? And I have a lot of trouble to explain to people about smart contracts. The best example that I can give is basically I have my, my mobile phone, I set it up 5 a.m., and I have my wife who also I told her to wake me up at 5 a.m. I trust more my, my mobile phone more than my wife because the mobile, my mobile phone is a smart contract. My wife is not, only a contract. Well, she might wake me up earlier or later, I don't know. But I'm sure, unless my battery is off, yeah? So I need to be all the time on. So smart contract is about auto-execution, it's automata. Everything is automated, encoded. And when you want to automate anything, you must think beforehand. You cannot think after. You cannot, it cannot be a post-event thing. It must be pre-taught. Yeah? It must be well-designed from the very beginning. And that's something that I, I found to be very interesting in the case of blockchain. Yeah? And, and this goes back to what something that Professor Kenneth Arrow talked way back in 1962, uh, one of the Nobel Prize in economics, and uh, one of the famous Arrow de Brew theorem come from Kenneth Arrow. He says that basically, if you thought about IPR or intellectual property rights, it should be thought of as an information, a set of information which can be commoditized. And, and when we say about, when we can commoditize something, then we can possibly buy or sell, possibly trade them, possibly realize some value out of them. This is very subtle. Uh, thought process, and I read this paper a long time ago, but then I recently read them again, reread re them again, and then I, I start to realize what probably Professor Arrow meant. That is, to make information, uh, sorry, intellectual property rights to be a commodity. Now, and in this case, it's a digital commodity now, because we can digitalize the commodity. Yeah? Now, and not only that, if we can digitalize them, but also we can put a proper economic benefits out of the commodity, then we have a, almost basically something that's marketable. And once marketable, it can be traded, risk can be analyzed, risk can be, risk pricing can be done, and so on. And because in case of finance or investments, the, the hardest part is basically to do what I call it the risk pricing. 
and, and, and my whole work has been always on the risk pricing. And you can see even the discussions today, that's, uh, I mean, a lot of discussions about many things. And one thing that's very hard to pin down, really, is about risk and how to price them. Well, it's very easy to price, let's say, a treasury bond. Even that is also hard work. It's very easy maybe to price a stock. But to price, let's take graphene, for example, the risk of this technology, well, the potential is so much, so great, but also, as I said, you may end up not coming to Gulfstream 5 to coming to Cranfield, still on the classical UK tube, yeah? Because the risk is very big. We don't know. And how then we can analyze that, yeah? So anyhow, once we can pin down, and instead of trying to talk about graphene as a whole, we can take specific applications of graphene. We can take specific areas within graphene. We can define the business model for that specific area. Then possibly something can be done. As I, I probably said to someone last night that, to invest, let's say, in a company that involves in graphene is a lot harder than to take one part of that company that doing something that I know there's a good, a better way to bring that to the market is much easier because I'm not interested in investing in the company. If, if I invest in the company, then I have to think about everything else. I have to think about who's the accountants. I have to think about who's the lawyers. I have to think about every damn thing that you can imagine. And sorry to use that language. <laughs> yeah, it's true. I face that all the time. And you end up basically babysitting the company. Yeah? Because of so much things. But what you want is basically only possibly one thing out of the whole thing. So in the case of by commoditizing, that's, that's what it meant. You can pick something. Not the whole company as a commodity. You can pick something and make that something to be a commodity. Yeah? Now, and, and in the whole process of blockchain, then this can be private, public, and so on and so forth. Now, What's most important when I said about everything is on the same platform? You deliver the whatever you want to deliver on this platform, but whatever that you're going to get out of it, means in monetary form, that's what the most important is, is also on the same platform. Now, whether you want to call that digital currency, cryptocurrency, maybe you want to call it Bitcoin or whatever, doesn't matter to me. But just think about the process itself. If it can be on the same platform, then the whole idea of reward is there, and the whole idea of punishment will be there. The whole idea of, uh, of, of uh, having uh, something that you can, is transparent to be there, and so many other features that can be accomplished. Yeah? Now, yeah. so, yeah, I'm done. Last, bit, last slide. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to stand between you and your lunch, so don't worry. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. Thank you. Theory of complete market. And uh, this theory of complete market is something that I, I love and I like to present this short slide because the notion of complete market is very important. And if you cannot bring some form of completeness to the technology investment market, then we would remain having the same questions over and over again for the next whatever years. That's number one. Number two, complete markets leads to optimal resources, means more investments coming instead of less investment coming with the right way of bringing the information right to the front. And this brings back into one more issue, which is what I call Turing Complete. And smart contracts are Turing Complete. That is to automate pretty much. And that's part of the technology that I think should be brought along in the invention, beside the invention of graphene, into the financial technology. Thank you very much.